Father, we are so glad to be here this morning. Any morning worshiping you and praising you is the best morning, Father, because you fuel our hearts, you fuel our minds. You give us the strength, Father, to get up. You give us the strength to take one more step. You give us the strength to move forward. And so we just want to thank you this morning and to praise you and worship you because you are a God who sees everything and you love all of your children. So this morning, as we worship and praise you, Father, I pray that it comes from our hearts and that you would be pleased with our worship this morning. Bless all who are here, bless all who are watching online, and bless the message as Pastor Gary brings it forth this morning. We love you, we praise you, in Jesus' most holy and precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Meridian Baptist Church, and we're so happy to be here. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. We're going to go ahead and begin with our weekly scripture challenge verse. Uh, Just as a reminder that the verse is supposed to be something that we resonate in our hearts as we go throughout the week, that we learn to apply it in our lives as we interact with believers and non-believers. So if you'll read along with me. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Romans 12, 9. Amen. Uh, We do broadcast both of our services, the 7.30 and the 10.30 service, on Facebook and YouTube, uh, as well as over the airwaves at 106.9 FM. Uh, The FM transmitter has a three-mile radius, so just make sure that you're nearby or, you know, as you're driving towards church, if you're still on your way, you can always tune in so you can hear everything uh, that God has for you today. Uh, Don't forget to fill out the connection card. It's in the bulletin. We do have a new uh, format for it. Uh, Very simple, very clean and elegant. Uh, Fill out all the information and drop it off in the offering today. If you do have a prayer request, you can fill it out on the back as well. And if you wish for the prayer request to be submitted anonymously, there's a little circle thing that you can circle as well. So this way that the people here at the church um, can pray for you or for your loved ones or for people that God has put on your heart to uh, have other believers come together and pray for. All right. Uh, We're going to go ahead and continue with our time of worship. Please stand. And as we get ready to uh, play the instruments, just give a wave to your neighbor and say hello. And we'll continue. Thank you. Father, we are so amazed by you this morning. We love you so much. And our hearts just want to sit with you this morning and feel your love, feel your presence. And I pray that you would continue to move as we listen to your words this morning, listen to what you have for us this morning. Be with us now, Father, as we hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Meridian. Good morning. It's time for our intercessory prayer. Our prayer verse this morning is, But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Luke 18, 16. Our emphasis this morning is, pray children come to know the love of Christ. If we do not bring our children up in the admonition of the Lord, Satan will be glad to fill in for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as always, we praise your holy and your precious name. Father, as your children, it is a pleasure to call you Abba, our Father, our Daddy. Father, we're eternally grateful that you are in control. Father, please continue to forgive us of our shortcomings, our worldly ways, our worldly thoughts. Father, please search us, cleanse us, and create in us a clean heart. Father, we just pray right now that you give us all your strength, your knowledge, and your wisdom to raise our children and bring them up in the ammunition of our Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. Father God, right now I want to lift my brother Gary up to you. Thank you for the message that you have put on his heart for him to deliver us today. Father, please think what is mine and speak with his lips. Father God, please use my brother as you see fit. Your word says that your word does not return void and it would accomplish what you would have it accomplish. Father God, also we would be remiss this morning if we did not pray for our dear pastor, Pastor Slade. Father, please put a hedge of checks around him and please give him and I and Gary traveling mercies uh, uh, get us back here safely. We love you and thank you. We say and ask all these things in your precious son's name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, saints. Good morning. And I have to say good morning to sinners, too, because you're in here, too. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But I'm appreciative of being here. I'm appreciative of having an opportunity to share God's word with you. Um, one of the, the intricate, not intricate, but some of the things that have really kind of um, perplexed me um, is simply why would God use me? I am unworthy. And for anyone who stands before you preaching the gospel that considers themselves worthy in and of their own self has a falsehood about them. So um, I stand before you humbly. I stand before you in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you simply about living past your breaking point. Now, I know this is probably more than likely a word of encouragement to every believer. And I know that we, um, we struggle with this. You know, sometimes we might call breaking points trials, but a trial is actually meant to bring you closer to God. A trial does not hold in and of itself any kinds of temptation. It is a, a, a happenstance, if you will, to bring you closer in your relationship with our Lord and Savior. But the breaking point, that's when you just get to a, a, a status of just saying, you know, I'm done. I can go no further. Now, this is where you really have a desire to give up. A breaking point is probably occurs when you're raising a rebellious child. You're just at your breaking point with this child. It's uh, probably maybe a family or friend uh, that, that, that takes advantage of your kindness. You're tired of dealing with them. You got a boss who doesn't respect you who doesn't understand your talents or even listens to your words, um, a micromanager kind of situation, always looking over your shoulder. And it could be a struggling relationship where you just reach your breaking point. So my words here for you are simply breaking points are indeed part of life. But how we deal with them, how we uh, incorporate them in our walk is something that's significant for a disciple or someone who just calls himself a Christian. A disciple is going to be more focused on the Lord and, and learning from Christ and his example, where a Christian is just somebody who knows of who knows of the character of Christ, or knows of a character in the Bible. So I'm appealing to you as disciples who may or may not be struggling today 
But I do know in your future, there has to be a breaking point coming your way. And you're going to have to be able to how to live through it. I'm, I'm, I'm an example of break, a person who broke and a person who's lived through a breaking point. I will not confide in any of you as to what I broke about, <laughs> but um, it does happen. It's not to say you lose your salvation. I'm not even going there. This is not even about that. Amen. This is just a word to encourage you to stay the course, yeah. to fight the fight, yeah. and keep pushing forward. That's right. You know, if you fall, get up. Amen. You know, absolutely. So our scripture comes out of Isaiah 41. We're probably only going to have about three different scriptures. The only one that's listed in your bulletin is Isaiah 41. However, others that I'm going to mention to you, I really would like for you to write down. And when you have an opportunity to go home and read them through and to see the application into living past your breaking point. So Isaiah 41, beginning at verse 10. The word of the Lord reads, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are here to hear your word. We pray, Father, for those who are battling a breaking point right now. Yes. We're asking, Father, for you to encourage them through your word and to allow them to apply your word in their hearts. I pray, Father, that you use me to bring forth your word to your people to honor and praise you. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So quickly speaking, here in, here in Isaiah, we are told, don't fear. Why? Why should you fear if the Lord is with you? We're also told, don't be dismayed. So that means don't consider this like a surprise attack. You know, God's saying, I already knew it was coming. So what you have to do is be able to live through this or live past this, this issue. And what is he going to do? He's going to strengthen us. He's going to give us hope and a future, as we learn in Jeremiah. But he's going to give us confidence in terms of getting through and living past this breaking point. God's not only available to be called upon, he is literally here with us. You got to believe that. If you don't believe that, then we need to pray for the Lord to help you believe that. Yes. That he is actually with us in our day-to-day -day encounters, in our day-to-day -day experiences, even the fact that we are having these breaking points, God is with us and he understands what we are going through. Every part of God's word is calculated to humble man, the pride of man. They are meant, it is meant to humble us and to make us little in our eyes. Why? Because we need to keep God big in our eyes. Yeah. It's not about us. You know, the unfortunate thing is we're, we're not all going to make it here when, when the Lord returns. You know, some of us ain't going to be around unless he shows up in the next minute. And he might. But we have to keep God big in our lives. You know, he's not just a figment of our imagination. He's not just something that we, we bring up like coffee on the, on the shelf when we want to make the coffee early in the morning. We were talking about coffee earlier. But anyway, we want to make coffee earlier in the morning. So we go to the shelf, grab the coffee, make our coffee, and it's good, full of caffeine, and it's really good to go. Puts us right on pace, get started with the day, right? God's not like that. God is with us 24-7, 365 days a year. He's with us. He's with you in your seats right now. He's with you when you're driving down the street on the highway and somebody throws a bird your way, right? He's with you in all of these things, even when your anger is starting to, to, to come up and you're ready to go off. You're reaching your breaking point because you're so mad. He's with you then. 
And he sees what you do. He sees how you respond. The Lord is our redeemer and he will help us, especially in our times of need. We just have to wait. That's hard for us. We don't want to wait. We want something now. But we have to wait on God's time. We have to stay faithful and be full of hope. Now, this message is probably not for everybody. But this message is for somebody Amen. who is at a point of just ready to give up. I want you to stay encouraged because in spite of what you think, God is here. He is available and he is. His word says and he is going to work all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All means all. It's not just the good things for good. Even the bad things, yes. he will work together for good. Yes. I know there was a time when I, I've shared this with you guys before, was at a point of being tied, T-I-D-E. That's tired of being tired. You wind up being tied. And, and, and I prayed to the Lord to ask for change. And because um, I was just tired of the whole situation, the circumstance. I had done all that I knew to do. I had come through, at least in my, in my opinion, um, a better person, a better man, a better man of God. And uh, I just couldn't step forward anymore. But it caused me to wait. I asked him for deliverance, and he caused me to wait. And he delivered me, but I had to be patient. Something we never pray for, right? We never pray for patience. We don't want the trials that it takes to get the patience, right? But we all want the fruit of the Spirit, right? Part of the fruit of the Spirit is patience. <laughs> So you're going to get it either way, whether you pray for it or not. It's part of the character of the disciple of Christ you are. Amen. Amen. And it's tough. It's tough to be patient. Yes, but we are God's chosen. I say this because God chose Israel to be his people. And the reason for God's choice of Israel was because Abraham himself was a very special friend of God. As a result of Abraham and our adoption, we've learned in the New Testament, to Abraham, we are all spiritual Israelites. So we are all chosen of God. As a result of being chosen of God, we have divine protection. So when we're at this point of break or breaking point, God is going to protect us. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to help us. He is going to uphold his people. Why? Because of the Abrahamic covenant that he promises to bless the seed of Abraham. So he's going to take care of his children. God, that is. And then the, we, we are also promised divine provision, which means he supplies our needs throughout our lifetime. That's an incredible thing to just rest in and of itself. No matter what you're going through, God is going to supply your need. Now, that's financial. That's probably even material. You know, all of that comes into play because we're looking at God who influences himself in the physical realm, even though he's spirit. There's nobody or nothing like him. Nobody can touch him. Nobody can come against him. He is always victorious. He never has a losing season. 
He never has to go to game seven and we just sit there and watch. He's always victorious. So we have these promises while we're considering going through the breakthrough or we're considering living past this breakthrough. We have this, these promises of protection and provision. So, okay, you got more month than money. Is that something surprising to God? Absolutely not. You know, you need food to eat. You got church brothers and sisters who can definitely help you out. You know, you need prayer about something. You have church brothers and sisters who can step up and, and, and be a part of your life. Not just somebody you see on Sunday, but somebody that you see if you're at the store, and you're, you're happy to see them. You know, it's a blessing to see, you know, whoever it is at the store and you're both shopping for grits. I don't know, whatever you might be shopping for. You know, I love grits. I love grits. But anyway, you, 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 you're happy to see each other. So what does that do? That brings a com camaraderie, yeah. you know, to us as believers. There's a cohesion in our spirit. So when you're going through these breaking points, you really have to start to share with someone you trust. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I felt it necessary, necessary to say that. You have to start sharing with someone you trust. Yeah. It's not just anybody. It, it would be improper for me to just share issues that I'm having with just anybody. Yeah. I need to share those issues with mature Christians who understand the issues that I'm going through. And the same is true for you, you know, who maybe have gone through. It's almost like you want to buy a house. Do you ask advice from someone who has never bought a house? Do you ask advice from someone who has purchased a house? and knows the steps and the processes, you know? And that's what we have to do. The Lord gave us free will. We have to use that in common sense. Yeah. So by definition, the point, a breaking point is the point at which something breaks away. Obvious, right? But the breaking point of something is the point at which stress has increased so much that things begin to fall apart or break down. Before something has reached its breaking point, it has undergone many trials and tensions. Pressure has built up so much that something must give way. When someone has reached their breaking point, they have become stressed to the point where they will never be the same again. It is as if something has broken. Now, I know this was a big lead up to my key truth, and that is consider your breaking point begins with a state of brokenness where God intervenes for his children when we let him take control. That brokenness is where God works. I'm going to repeat that. Consider that your breaking point begins with a state of brokenness where God intervenes for his children when we let him take control. That brokenness is where God works. Many years ago, I had a great friend and we used to always talk about when God works. He's gone with the Lord now. He was a member of this church, young brother. I loved him. He helped me and L'Oreal so much. Matter of fact, he would take her to doctor's appointments when I couldn't. A great, great man. And we would talk about when God was going to show up. And I'm like, you know, God's going to show Well, I'm not going to say how we argued it through, but we agreed that God is going to show up in that 1% that man says is impossible. God is going to do what all he needs to do in the brokenness of a human heart or the brokenness of human spirit yeah. to bring glory to him. Yes. Because it's not about us. Right. Everything is about him. Right. Right. Everything is about him. Our willingness to praise, our willingness to, to, to sing songs of praise, our willingness to worship all of it is about him. 
It's not about us. So this brokenness is where we believe God is most effective. You're broken in your breaking point when you're ready to quit. When you feel there's nothing more that I can do. That's when God comes in. That's that 1%. Yes. You know? Now that happens in relationships, that happens in jobs, that happens in, in your neighbors, your neighborhood, or, or whatever. That brokenness in terms of your effectiveness in honoring God is, is evident in the brokenness. So, I got a few questions. I got a few reactions. I want you to ponder these things for yourself, and then later we'll come back together and I'll explain. No. I'm not teaching. I'm not teaching. I am encouraging each and every one of you, all right? So one of the questions are, <clears throat> how does a believer or a disciple even reach the breaking point? And then, is there a part where the breaking point is a good thing? Disciples reach the breaking point just because we're human. It is, some might argue, and arguably so, a kind of trial that's put upon us. When I say trial, I'm talking a God-given trial to bring us closer to the Lord. Some breaking points are evident and consequences of our own sin because we are sinful by nature. Some of our breaking points are caused and manifested behind the sin that we have either committed or have knowledge of. But breaking points are going to continue to manifest themselves in our lives. If you haven't had a breaking point or you don't see one coming, just keep living. Amen. I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. It's going to happen. If you talk to some of the more mature saints, they'll tell you, just keep living. It's coming. And the way you get through it is through the Lord. That's right. It ain't got nothing to do with you. You don't have the capacity or the, or the capability of being in control to change your circumstances or surroundings in terms of spiritual activity that's coming against you. A breaking point could be part of spiritual warfare. Or it just could be I got a knucklehead child I'm raising and I'm just done with them. It's true. Yes. As these breaking points continue to, to make themselves in our lives, if they remain untouched or, un, un, or not dealt with, we can wind up uh, uh, getting depressed. Christians do get depressed. I want to say that again. Christians do get depressed. It has nothing to do, again, with losing salvation. It has nothing to do with, you know, I don't know what God can do for me now. It's just, it's just, a, 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 it's just a bad situation for you to be in. You don't want to be in it, and you're not happy about being there, and it leads to a state of depression. Now, the best way to get out of anyone that is depressed is through therapy. Some of the best therapy is in God's word with a responsible therapist. Amen. 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 So God allows us to have free will and should always, we should always choose him and his plan. A lot of times we choose him, but our plan. We need to choose him and his plan. Yes. Okay. Now, is there a part where the breaking point is a good thing? What say you? I say yes. I say yes. Now, the reason why I say yes is because 
It forces us to surrender our will to God's will. Now that's always a good thing. So we're no longer exerting control over anything and we have to rely on the Lord for our deliverance or our blessings or getting us out of this. And this is why we have trials to bring us closer to the Lord. So we got some questions, a couple of them. I could possibly think of a few more. I'm not going to go through that, but I do want to talk about some of these reactions that we exhibit when we're at these breaking points. Now, the Bible talks about walking with stress. And if we walk with stress, we can have mental and physical consequences. We can have strokes. I mean, these are physical activities that really can break us down. Strokes, heart attacks, there could be problems in our uh, willingness to be discipled or have discipleship issues. And we can also have, you know, lacks of foundational joy in any relationship. Verbal abuse can really affect our minds. So I'm going to go back here and talk to you about my stroke. I had a stroke in the fall of 2014. Um, although at that point I was living in uh, Riverside County, um, I, I didn't like the doctors or the hospitals up there, so I was transported down here to Sharp Memorial. Um, I was only visited by my friends from Meridian, not from the current church that I was attending. Amen. Not that it was too far away, but it's just how it was. And I was visited by um, several people. I'm not going to name names because I'm sure I will forget some, but um, it made a big difference in how I viewed Meridian as a body of believers. I couldn't put together a tie and a shirt. I mean, like, in a picture. They bring you these photos and they want you to be able to, you know, place them together, see what the relationships are. I couldn't do it, you know. I didn't know that a tie went with a shirt. Um, I didn't know that a jacket went with pants. But I was dressed and I knew how to dress for myself, but I just, I just couldn't put it all together. I knew who my children were, but I didn't know their names. You know, um, and it was a struggle. Something in me broke that day. Now, what happens is there's a lot of things that go on in our lives that we hold to our hearts, <clears throat> and we need to stop doing that. You know, some of this stuff we're going through, as my, my mama was saying, the rigmarole, it's all about nothing. It doesn't really matter. But some things we hold true to ourselves and, and they cause physical issues. You know, um, I used to be able to remember everything and could repeat it verbatim, whatever was said or what have you. I lost that. So um, as a result of that stroke, if I don't have it in my calendar, it doesn't exist. And, and I've resigned myself to that, you know. Uh, so you should see my calendar. It's quite full because I don't want to forget anything from anybody. But, um, you know, those are some of the, the physical stresses that, that manifest themselves as a result of a breaking point. And how do you live past that? You know, that's what we're talking about. And then we have some other cliches that have become cliches that shouldn't be. Sister Barbara Steer used to always say, too blessed to be stressed. And that's a mantra we should, we should repeat. Yeah. Why? Why should we repeat it? Because God has influence over everything. Nothing is beyond God's influence. Amen. So if we can realize that when we start seeing these breaking points develop, there are character traits of a breaking point. You know, and I, and I read through some of those that with the stresses increase so much that things begin to fall apart. That's the breaking point. 
You know, a breaking point of relationship is, is just not coming together. We're not committed to each other. We're not showing support. We're not being respectful. Uh, you know, love, puppy love is gone. So then now what? We got real love. We're trying to get through. We got to deal with some of the children. If we have children, we got to deal with the finances or the houses or housings or whatever. All of that can be part of that breaking point. And as you see these things coming up, and, and beginning to show themselves, it's really time to turn to the Lord, more so than turning to each other. It's really time to get out some therapy and a therapist to help you through these struggles and these situations, because this, 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 mm, this game we're talking is real. And people are dying and going to hell for what? For a bunch of money or, or material stuff? or just giving up their lives, putting bullets in their head, for what? Ain't nothing worth that. Amen. You know, and, and, and I apologize if I'm stepping on any toes, because some of you may have experienced people who have committed suicide, and I'm not saying anything negative about that, but what I am saying is there's a breaking point, yes. and they reach that breaking point, yes. where something falls apart, something falls away. I have a word. I've shared it with you before. And I think if you use this mantra from Sister Barbara, too blessed to be stressed, I call it Godfidence. It's more than just confidence. It's Godfidence. I have confidence in God. And sometimes I have to keep saying that to myself when I'm driving down the street or riding on my motorcycle, um, which I do love. Um, but I'm going to have to stop so much riding it. But it is much better on gas than, than my Suburban. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, I digress. Um, God's finance is confidence in God. And I keep saying that. I am confident in what God is going to do. I am confident that God is going to deliver me from whatever situation that I am ready to allow to break me. My children, I love my children. I have been blessed with some great children. Um, their mother, their mother did it. I had nothing to do with it, um, except for their creation. Um, but when they come with problems, you know, it's, it's like, I ask them, have you prayed about it? And usually, my daughter will say, yeah. My sons might say, oh, okay. Um, but my daughter will say, yeah, and then I'm like, you know, well, it might just be a time to wait. Just wait. Let God move. Let him do what he's going to do, you know? But I know if I, and here, you know, you're starting putting yourself in it, you know? And it's like, you need to move yourself out of the way, you know, and let God walk through. So, and usually it works out for the best and the better because God's been involved and we've allowed him to come in. Now, he's not going to come in unless you allow him to come in. He is not going to bombard himself in your experience uh, because, you know, you're not a robot. You are a free-willed creature that is allowed to make decisions and come up with uh, uh, your mindset and decision mindset based on, you know, whatever uh, uh, ideas you have or whatever information or data you're able to process. But once we do let him in and we use this concept of Godfidence, our lives will be better. We'll live past the breaking point. We'll be better suited to help others and comfort others with the comfort he has given us. So another scripture I have here is out of Matthew 11, uh, 28 through 30. I was in the middle of seminary, actually towards the end of my um, degree, and my wife died. I was devastated. You know, it's not an easy thing to have a spouse pass on. I don't care how long you've been together. I don't care how long you've been married. It's not easy. 
I had known L'Oreal since she was 12 years old. She used to live right down the street. Remarkable woman, man. Remarkable. Um, but anyway, when the Lord took her, it took a part of me. And it was very difficult, you know. I remember the day she died. July 28th, 2009, 2.32 p.m. And I looked over, our pastor was with me. He wasn't in the room. Just me and my two sons were in the room. Um, I know Sister Faye was there, I believe. Charlene couldn't handle this, so she went out of the room. Yeah. Anyway. I'm kind of getting off there. My head was tripping. Okay. I asked the Lord, what now? I told Pastor I need 24 hours for anybody who talks to me. So I asked the Lord, what now? And I didn't get an answer. And I didn't know what the answer was. I didn't know about this stuff. Because I'm really saying nothing new to any of you. This is all stuff you really already know. But sometimes we just have to be reminded. That's like the preacher needs to be preached to sometimes. Yes. So um, when I asked the Lord what now, and I didn't have an answer, I wasn't looking for an answer, and again, I didn't know, know these things at that point, the seminary instructor gave me this verse out of Matthew 11. And it reads, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now my seminary professor gave me the scripture to, to try and calm my anxiety and nerves. I wasn't anxious to complete something. I was just anxious as to what's next. I was anxious as to why, yeah, I guess I did. Why did you take her? Why did you choose her? Why her? Then, after that, it's always, well, what about me? So at that point, I realized that it took probably about nine years to figure it out that it's not about me. Yes. It's really about her and him. And the pain that she was in that I couldn't see until afterwards. You know how you get the pictures yes. after and then, then you could see the pain yes. in their faces and it was incredible. We were doing, I thought, a great ministry here at the church. You know, working with the young adults and they were all uh, uh, doing well and and they're all still doing well and, and, and moving in life and praising the Lord. And, you know, we've got a lot of very successful uh, young adults who were products of Meridian. Um, and I thought, you know, okay, Lord, you know, maybe he could be like, she could be like, you know, Hezekiah and get a few more years and, and then take her. And I thought, well, I'm a, as soon as I got comfortable and I was like, well, we're going to grow old. In, in, our, in our relationship, you're going to be like 65 and chilling, you know? Um, then he took her. And it, it was a horrible, a horrible time. Yes. A horrible time. However, God does see us through. And in these scriptures, we can start to see where he can, can help us. In the first part, in verse 28 out of Matthew 11, it says... You who are weary and burdened, that means there's a breaking point either on its way or coming. He says, I'm going to give you rest. That's physical rest. He's going to give you a sense of peace to sleep, to lounge, to take a nap, to lay down, whatever. He's going to give you physical rest. Verse 28, 29 says, take my yoke upon you. Now, we know what yokes are used for in the oxen that they use to help them with the laborer, and normally it's a, it's a laborious styles of, of activity that the oxen is doing, grinding stones or whatever, I mean grinding wheat on the stone or, or whatever. But he says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. 
for I am gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So in verse 29, we not only have the ability to be a disciple and learn from our rabbi, we also have rest for our soul. Our spirit can be calm during these breaking points. Because I was at a breaking point and not really knowing it. And when this was kind of explained to me, it made so much sense. I can get physical rest. I can get spiritual rest if I allow it, if I give it all to him. And then the verse 30, it says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That means your work day is, is on the nil or very, very easy work day, right? Because his yoke, you're using his yoke. And you're using his burden, not yours. Which then means that we're giving our burden over to him. He's got it. And I'm able to, I'm going to say, walk free. Because that's what he has endured. And that's what he is willing to give me. So the application of this, I'm ex-military. So I am a vet and very proud of my service to my country. Um, so I'm going to use this. The application of living past the breaking point. We have to use what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Now you can get PTSD from the battlefield. You can get PTSD from living in some areas in the urban environment. You can get PTSD from abusive relationships. All of these things provide post-traumatic stress disorder. But in the spiritual sense, we need patience, trust, surrender, and discipline. PTSD for us spiritually. Now, the way that we apply living paths, we have to have the ability to allow for and wait on Christ in whatever situation you're dealing with. That's the patience part. That's the fruit of the spirit that we get that we don't even have to pray for. Patience. <clears throat> and then trust. We have to trust that Christ is going to intercede and act for, act for us. Now, we have to believe he's never lied, and we always got to believe that God has never failed. So if we trust those things, regardless of the situation at hand, if it's, if it's, let me see where I'm at. If it's anything outside of murder, God can help you through it. And if you've had to have murdered, we got an example in Moses. I said that, but it didn't come out the right way. I hope no one in here has murdered. But I do want to say, you could be like Armani. Armani asked me, she says, have you, ever, have you ever murdered anyone? She wants to be an investigator or something like that. And I was just like, you know, they tell us in the Navy, I can neither confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons on board USS whatever. <laughs> so that's kind of what I did. And it's just like, every time she sees me, she asks me the same question. But anyway, I'm not saying that, that murdering is okay. It is not, it is not, it is not. Thou shalt not kill, okay? But what I am saying, we have had murderous thoughts. And murderous thoughts could be, you know, a, a, a problem. Uh, for us anyway, but we do have to believe, we do have to understand that Christ is the intercessor for us. Even now, he's on the right-hand side of God, interceding for us yeah. daily for each and every one of us. So we have to believe that. We have to trust that. Then we have to surrender. We have to let go and let God. Yeah. If you are in a relationship and you are not in a happy relationship, then it's time for therapy and it's time to, to commit, recommit, resupport, reconvene, revow, whatever it is to re-up in your relationship. <clears throat> so we have to let go and let God. And discipline, we, that's really kind of like discipleship where we have to learn from him. He tells us in, in his word that he is gentle and humble in heart and that we can learn from him. And our training in righteousness is always, Christ is our example. Yeah. Okay? Now, as we begin to go through our spiritual PTSD, we have to continue in our times of prayer. It is hard to pray when you are depressed. Yes. 
I'm telling you from experience. It is hard to pray when you are depressed. We can put on the mask, and we, we do such a very good job of that. You know, we put on the mask, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. <clears throat> the Lord is just working in my life, and... Sorry. We say so much. I'm a, well, it is what it is. Yeah. Crap. That it, that it doesn't make sense. If you're hurting, then say, I'm hurting. Amen. If, if it's bothering you, then say, it's bothering me. Your brother or your sister will understand and will stand up and be your brother and sister by understanding that this is affecting you. Yeah. And they will do all that they know to stop it from affecting you. Yeah. Especially if they have any kind of control over it. Yeah. That's just showing love. So we have to learn to hand our human will and our longings, belongings over to God. Living past the breaking point. We have to learn to trust God and risk everything on God's goodness and his ability to be with us and provide to the bitter end. Now I say risk. I don't think it's truly a risk to give God everything. Amen. Because I, I mean, there's no better hands to be in. This say, I mean, he's better than all state, you know what I mean? There's no better hands to be in than in the hands of God. To be, you know, wrapped in, in the bosom. Uh, it, man, it's no better place. Pastor Walter and I used to always joke with each other about seeing a glimpse of his glory, sometimes in our worship services. And um, it was a blessing to see that. And when we could, we would just look at each other and just smile about it because you could see the, the glimpse. Yeah. And all we needed was just a glimpse of the glory of God in our worship. You know, and that was, that was a beautiful thing to have. But as we give everything over to him, we have to realize that he's working like a way maker. So he's working even when we don't see him, he's working. Yes. You know, even when we don't feel it, he's working. You know, he never stops. He never stops working. All right. Um, but he works all things together for good. All things to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Yes. All things, not just the good things, and not just the bad things, not even just the mediocre things. All is all. Yes. Now there are consequences we have to pay for our sin, yes. but God is still gonna work all things together for good. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling like you're at the breaking point, I keep pointing back because it's up there, but I should point back there like that. But if you're feeling like you're at the breaking point, God works all things together for good. Yeah. Isaiah tells us, don't fear. Don't be dismayed. God is basically saying, I got you. Just rest on me. Take my yoke upon you. Give me yours, and I'll show you how easy it is. Amen. 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 So we're studying this book from, from Pastor. A few of us, I think, are in here. Have uh, uh, I think it's Adele Calhoun. It might be Adelaide. Is it Adele? I think so. Okay. Anyway, she's got this paraphrase. Well, I paraphrased it, but I want to give her credit for the book. It's part of that uh, spiritual. Um, disciplines, conversations and spiritual disciplines that we're going over with our pastor. And it says, you know, just think this through. Imagine, if you will, Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus didn't pretend everything was fine. Now, that's why I tell you, if it ain't fine, it ain't fine. It's okay Amen. for it not to be fine. Be transparent. Jesus was vulnerable. He was weeping and depended on the prayers of friends who let him down. So when a friend betrays you, don't stuff your pain. Go stand with Jesus in the garden and tell him how you feel. Then imagine Jesus will turn to you and say, I know what's happening and I've got your back. Let's stick together here. I often think about 
getting me a little pillow, being in the fetal position, and just whatever it takes, you know? That works for me. Used to be a bigger guy, but a pretty decent sized guy, and I'm in a fetal position with a pillow talking to the Lord. I'm cool with that. You should be cool with how it takes for you, too. So when your situations are so private, you want to isolate yourself, you need to go find Jesus. Find him in the wilderness and sit with him and let him contend with your situation. The thing that you have to do is surrender. We have to also realize, I'm almost finished, we have to also realize that Jesus lived through a huge miscarriage of justice. His trial was rigged, his crucifixion was unjust. So when life hands you unfairness, Jesus invites you to be in solidarity with him and his own sufferings. You don't have to face sorrow alone. In fact, you don't have to face anything alone. Amen. It is important for you to share. Stop walking through situations alone. Share with someone you trust. In the world of Alcoholics Anonymous, you go to one of their meetings, some of you may have never been, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, I've been to several. And, and, and in those meetings, people share. They share what it takes for them not to take the next drink. And it's cool, because when you're sharing this information, that means now you're getting it off you. Yes. You don't have to hold it on you anymore. And behind holding this stuff is what causes us to take the next drink. Yeah. So if I share my issues and I share my concerns and I share my problems or I share what has happened to me, sometimes good, sometimes bad, I'm not taking it with me no more. In our spiritual walk, we need to start sharing like, you know, AA people do. Yeah. We need to start sharing with somebody or a group, you know, that you can trust with this like accountability group or accountability partner, which you can trust and to share those issues, to share those breaking points so that you don't have to carry it around with you no more. So then you won't be fighting against that next drink, at least until the next meeting. And that's what it's all about. It's not spiritual perfection, it's spiritual progress. That's it. And you can't beat nobody up for that. So anyway, I also want you to know, God has never started from the bottom to get to the top. He's never started from a failing position and then achieve victory. God starts at victory Amen. to continue in victory. Amen. <clears throat> so as his children, we need to get a mindset of being victorious, where we start at victory and we will end in victory. Yes. We're not starting to get there. We're already there. Yes. So we have to remember that and we have to claim that. We, we go through a lot of these verses and, and they've become cliches. Uh, Psalms 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But it's a cliche for us. We need to stop making these words cliches. Yeah. And we need to look at the value of these words. In my breaking point, yes, I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. But I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Yeah. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yes. Prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. All of these words are not just words. They are decrees of victory. And we should look more at the Psalms to helping us because they were written by folks who experienced real struggles and hard trials just like we do. And God's never failed them. So why do we think he's going to fail us? Isaiah 41.10 says, the chosen of God have nothing to fear. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Christ cares enough about you and for you 
That's to ease your burdens you carry by giving you his. So surrender to his will for your life. Praise him when things go wrong. Praise him when things go wrong. Praise him when things go right. Okay? Intentionality is key. You got to ask yourself, and you got to be really focused on this. Why would you think that Christ wants harm to come to you? The Bible tells us every good and perfect gift comes from above. But yes, our sinfulness has consequences. And we do experience some of those consequences that may take us to a breaking point. But there is an ability to live past that breaking point. Because our Lord is going to work all things together for us. Throughout the Old Testament, we always read, it came to pass. It came to pass. One dilemma after another. One breaking point after another. The fact that it came to pass means that it's temporary. Our breaking points are temporary. We just have to wait on the Lord. We just have to let him renew our strength. I was on my way to services this morning and everlasting God was on the radio. It says strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. That's such a powerful statement. The more we wait, the stronger we become. It's not about us performing the action. It's about us relying on him to take care of the, of the battle. Yeah. <clears throat> we have to hold fast to our faith and have our confidence and hope in the Lord. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. So for anybody who is at a breaking point, nearing a breaking point, you can live past your breaking point. But the only way to live past it is to give it to the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we just simply thank you for just being an omnipotent God. We praise you today, Lord, because you are the one who is the audience of our praise, Father. We lift up those who know you, and we even lift up those who do not know you, Father, that they would come into the knowledge of who you are as Lord and Savior. We believe, Father, that today is the day for someone to grab the strength and gather the strength it takes to walk securely with you. Bless those who will admit to needing you. Bless those who will admit to being surrendered to you. And help us all, Father, to walk a path that you will be proud of. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.